Jesus lived in Roman-occupied Judea as a member of an oppressed people. It's natural, then, that a key part of his message was a severe criticism of the value system that the Romans represented. Jesus takes aim specifically at the traditional warrior ethic that we have seen in so many of our texts. In contrast to this, he proposes an entirely new way of looking at human relations. This can be seen most clearly in the famous Sermon on the Mount. The so-called Beatitudes, which, with which the sermon commences, begin as follows. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. According to the Greco-Roman value system, the goal was to be strong and to conquer others. This was what the warrior ethic dictated, and we've seen it at work in, among others, Homer, Herodotus, and Thucydides. The weak and the socially disenfranchised were never given a second thought. Now Jesus reverses this and praises the weak. Indeed, his teaching seems in many ways to be aimed at them. To the mind of the Greek or Roman warrior, the idea of the meek inheriting the earth or achieving anything at all was an utter absurdity. Jesus continues, quote, Blessed are the merciful, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. As we've seen for the Greeks and the Romans, the goal was not to be merciful, but just the opposite. To their mind, pity and mercy are the roots of suffering. The goal was not to make peace, but to conquer others, even if they had done one no wrong. Jesus turns this traditional view on its head and teaches exactly the opposite. Since in our modern culture, we're all familiar with these lines from Matthew, it's easy to overlook their radical and revolutionary nature at the time. In the sermon, Jesus goes on to give a number of different ethical principles. Here he again shows his radicalism by claiming, quote, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. In the ears of the Roman occupying forces of Judea, this must have sounded like utter nonsense. The obvious goal was to conquer one's enemies. The suggestion that we should have any sympathy for, for them, let alone love them, would have seemed absolutely ludicrous. Along the same lines, Jesus also focuses on the forgiveness of others. This too is a new principle. According to the traditional warrior ethic, if one has suffered some insult or harm, then one is duty bound to avenge it. If someone kills one of your family members, you have a sacred obligation to kill them. The guiding principle is vengeance. Jesus now replaces this principle with that of forgiveness. Once again, this opens up an entirely new way of conceiving of ethics and human relations. One of the most famous ethical maxims of the Sermon on the Mount is that which has come to be referred to as the Golden Rule. Jesus enjoins his auditors as follows, quote, In everything, do to others as you would have them do to you. This can be conceived as a replacement of the principle articulated by the Athenian delegation in the Melian Dialogue when they claimed that it was only natural that the strong conquer the weak and the weak simply accept whatever conditions the strong offer them. Clearly, the Athenians themselves would not enjoy living according to this law if they were the ones who were weak. Jesus' moral injunction levels the relation between strong and weak. It claims that it doesn't matter how strong one is or what one can compel the other person to do. Instead, the moral test is how you would like other people to treat you, and then this is to be used as the model for how you should treat them. Jesus thus offers a moral principle that's intended to apply to everyone equally and not one that serves the interests only of the strong. Another famous maxim from the Sermon on the Mount is that you should not retaliate when someone hurts you. It's written that Jesus said, quote, do not resist an evildoer, but if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. He claims that one should, not, one should endure passively the injuries that one suffers. Indeed, one should, in a sense, even invite further injuries. This is the exact opposite of the hero mentality, which is driven by honor. If someone injures you, this is a violation of your honor, and it must be avenged. Thus, one must strike back. Compare Jesus' principle with Callicles' disdainful description of what he refers to as the shameful behavior of the weakling or slave who is wronged or insulted, but is too weak to do anything about it. As is well known, this can lead to one act of violence after another, since if everyone acts in this way, then it would be impossible to stop the series of acts of retaliation 
since with each new one, someone else is injured or killed and the cycle continues. This kind of tit-for-tat retribution is seen in many works, such as the Icelandic epic Njal's Saga. Jesus' maxim pleads for stopping this kind of exchange of violence before it even gets started. One of the most influential elements of Jesus' teaching is his advocacy of nonviolence. In warrior cultures, it only makes sense that the way in which one makes a great name for oneself is by means of violent actions. The stories of the ancients are all about wars and violent conflicts. We're more sensitized to this today, but in the ancient world, engaging in violence was, as we've seen, not regarded as anything particularly negative. So in criticizing the use of violence, Jesus is making a radical claim. When he's arrested, one of Jesus' followers draws a sword and strikes one of those trying to take Jesus. It's then written that Jesus reproached him, saying, quote, put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Even when he's beaten, taunted, and humiliated, he refuses to react violently. Indeed, following his own maxim to turn the other cheek, he offers no resistance whatsoever to the violence done against him. This approach to things would be unthinkable for a warrior. The Christian ethic can be seen as a revolutionary idea at the time. Although it took centuries to establish itself, this ethic fundamentally changed people's intuitions. While most of us would probably agree with the basic principles of the Christian ethic, it can be argued that in many ways we're still struggling to live up to the high standards that this ethic posits.